All right, let's get started. Question number one, here we go. Which of the following is classified as personal property? We have A, easements. We have B, minerals still in the ground. We have C, water still underground. Or D, leasehold estates and residential properties. And the answer is D. Now let's look at the explanation. Leasehold estates are personal property, not real property. Now as a reminder, personal property, you can hold it, you can touch it. The other three options, easements, minerals still in ground, and water still underground, those are attached to the land. As a reminder, real property is property that is attached, as these three are, or run with the land. So of course the answer here, that is personal property, is gonna be leasehold estates and residential properties. Let's go to question number two. Question number two is, what does a standard title policy insure against? Let me read that again. What does a standard title policy insure against? We have A, an easement by prescription. We have B, a recorded deed in the chain of title that was not properly delivered. We have C, claims of persons who are in possession of the property. And we have D, losses taken by improved real property. Take a second, I want you to read it. I want you to understand it. Let's go to the answer. The answer is B, a recorded deed in the chain of title that was not properly delivered. Explanation, a standard policy will only guard against claims against matters of record. It does not protect against parties in possession. Quick reminder when it comes to this, I love this topic actually. When it comes to title insurance, it protects the title. Meaning if something happened in the chain of title years past, Somebody at the county clerk's office recorded it wrong. They made a mistake with the name. They misspelled the name. They forgot to take somebody off. They forgot to put somebody on. So in this case, it protects the homeowner of any mistakes ever done or misfilings ever done with their property. Hope that helps. Next one. Here we go. Next question. A broker who was hired by a buyer to help purchase a property must reveal all significant and material information to the buyer. Which of the following is not considered significant in or material information? Answer A, the owner of the property recently got a divorce. Answer B, there is an observable leak in the roof of the property. Answer C, the age of the property. Answer D, the square footage of the home. I want you to carefully review these. Which one of these is not a material defect? Which one of these do you not have to disclose? Think about that. All material defects must be disclosed. Of these four, think about it, this is actually pretty clear. Which one is not a material defect on the property? The answer is, let's take a look. A, the owner of the property recently got a divorce. What does that matter when it comes to the condition of the property? It doesn't. The homeowner's marital status has nothing to do with the condition of the property. So the answer, of course, would be the owner of the property recently got a divorce. Who the hell cares? Next question, one of my favorites. We had a great vlog on this. Here we go. In the formation of a contract, now we're talking about contracts. In the formation of a contract, which of the following would not make the contract voidable would not make the contract voidable a fraud b a minor who entered into a contract c the person entering the contract was incapacitated at the time d illegal purpose the answer is d illegal purpose let's read the explanation the illegal purpose makes the contract void that's crucial we discussed this many times Either a contract is voidable or void. Anytime, anytime something of illegal purpose is done, illegal intent, it's void. It's not voidable. I want you to think of void, X. It can't happen. It should have never been created. So in this case, anything that's illegally, purposely done, void. Void, void, not voidable. Great question. Next question, number five. Truth in lending says consumers must be informed of credit terms by which of the following? The lender the real estate agent, the broker, the escrow company. Look at that question. It's very simple, it's black and white. Truth in lending says consumers must be informed of credit terms by, the key word here is lending. So of course, that probably would be the lender. Wouldn't you think so? Let's take a look. Let's confirm that. The answer is A, lender, you are right. The lender must inform the buyer of the credit terms. The lender must inform the buyer of anything having to do with that loan. Let's move on to the next one. Question number six. A contract wherein each party has a specific obligation to perform is referred to as a express contract, divisible contract, unilateral contract, bilateral contract. Let's carefully review this question one more time for keywords here. 
for key words. This is crucial when it comes to your state exam. One word could change the whole question, so we have to look at these words carefully. A contract wherein each party, now each party means there's more than one party. There's two or more people involved, typically two when it comes to real estate. So we know there's at least two people involved here. Of these four options, of these four answers, which one would be referring to two people? Express contract, divisible contract, unilateral contract, or bilateral contract? Now that was a hint. Two people. Answer is bilateral contract, D. Now if you had one party in an escrow, and it can't happen, an individual can hire an escrow company just to manage paperwork. That would be unilateral. But when you have two people and each of them promise to perform an act, one promises to give money, one promises to give up their property, you have a bilateral contract, which is used often in real estate. Explanation here, a bilateral contract is an agreement in which both parties make a promise to do something or to refrain from doing something, and both are obligated to fulfill the promise. Bilateral, two people. Let's move on. What is the difference between a judgment lien and a mechanics lien? A. Judgment liens are not enforceable until recorded. B. Judgment liens are involuntary. C. Mechanic liens are created by law. D. Mechanic liens may take priority much earlier than when they are recorded. What is the difference between a judgment lien and a mechanics lien? And the answer is D. Mechanic liens may take priority much earlier than when they were recorded. Now, what does this mean? Let's take a look here at the explanation. Mechanic liens take priority based upon when the entire project commenced, while a judgment lien takes priority from the date they are recorded. Very simple question. Mechanic liens, please keep in mind that the commencement of that project is when the lien can be placed. Way back when the project started. When it comes to a judgment lien, the minute that judgment lien is placed on the property, that's the date it begins. So the difference is that the mechanic lien can be placed on the property much sooner than the judgment lien. Got it? That's the biggest difference. Key here, let me emphasize this. Seriously, key here is this. Mechanics lien, I want you to, I want you to attach it to the word commencement of the project, to those words. Mechanics lien, commencement of the project. That's when it happens. Next question. If a broker misrepresents his principal's property, what could possibly happen to the principal? A, cancellation of the sale by the prospective buyer. Damages may be awarded to the buyer. The seller may owe damages to the buyer for broker misrepresenting facts. D, any of these. The answer is D, any of these. Let's go through this one more time. This is actually very, very important. If a broker misrepresents his principal's property, right off the bat, we know this is wrong. You should never misrepresent your principal's property. As a reminder, as a reminder, as a broker, you have to go ahead and disclose every single defect on the property. You can't lie when it comes to the property condition. Bottom line is this, disclose, disclose, disclose. Next one, time, title, interest, and possession refers to A, partnership, B, survivorship, C, several T, D, adverse possession. When it comes to this question, please remember, time, title, interest, and possession have to deal with taking title on a property. How to take title on property, which of these refers to time, title, interest, and possession all being done at the same exact time? Answer is survivorship. Explanation, time, title, interest, and possession are characteristics of joint tenancy, which is a way to take title when you purchase property, which has the right of survivorship. Now the right of survivorship means this. Probably already know this, but let's remind you. Right of survivorship. You have three, four, two people who bought a house at the same exact time. Let's make it simple. You have two people, a husband and wife who bought a house together in 1975. The husband dies. Now what? Well, what happens is through the right of survivorship, and it's right here, through the right of survivorship, which is answer B, the 50% that was owned by the husband who passed away now goes directly to the wife because of that simple term survivorship. Right of survivorship. Hence, don't forget, this couple bought the house at the same exact time, took title at the same time, had the same amount of interest, 50-50, and they possessed it at the same time. So when it comes to time, title, interest, and possession, please remember, right of survivorship. Next question, real estate agent Lois does not belong to any trade organization, a real estate board. Lois does not belong to a real estate board and is using the tagline, a new type of realtor. This practice is A, correctable. 
All she has to do is not capitalize the R in realtor. B, it's a violation of the Truth in Lending Act. C, none of these. D, cause for her license to be revoked or suspended. This is actually a great question. If you aren't a member of your local real estate board, it means you didn't join the National Association of Realtors, which means you're not a realtor. This particular agent, Lois, is promoting herself as a realtor without being a member of the board, which means she's not a realtor. She's lying. Answer is D, cause for her license to be revoked or suspended. She was misleading the public. She's not a realtor. If you didn't pay your dues to be a realtor with the National Association of Realtors, you can't call yourself a realtor. Bottom line. Let's move on to the next one. Here we go with the next one. Real estate agent Janice specializes in selling single family dwellings in Santa Monica. Ah, beautiful Santa Monica. Janice can refuse to accept a property listing for which of the following reasons? Nice and simple. Janice, a real estate agent, works in Santa Monica. She can refuse to work with the listing in which of the following situations? A, the minority status of the resident. B, the owner wishes to price the home $20,000 higher than the most expensive house for sale. C, all of these. Or D, the majority of the homeowners are minorities in that particular neighborhood. Which one of these allows her to not take the listing? And the answer is B, the owner wishes to price the home $20,000 higher than the most expensive house for sale. Now think about that. Why is this the answer? Because ethics is involved here and the law. And the law says you can't discriminate against anybody. Now, let me give you a quick example, very quick example. This actually happened to me before when a seller said, Rico, please price my house at this price. And I said, Mr. Seller, you must be out of your mind. That's much too much money. No one will ever give us an offer on that. I don't want to waste my time nor your time. I will not take this listing if you price it at that price, Mr. Seller. And I refused the listing. He wanted too much for the, for the property. It wasn't worth what he wanted it to be worth. So I was able to reject that listing. Now, mind you, quick tidbit. He called me a couple days later and said, Mr. Rico, I understand you are correct. I was pricing it too high. Please come back and list my property. So it helps to be honest with people. Uh, when it comes to the law, you can't discriminate. Please remember that. You cannot discriminate. Let's move on. All right, next question. Is it acceptable to use the address 15001 River Way for a legal document pertaining to a real estate transaction? Fantastic question. Is it acceptable to use address 15001 River Way for a legal document pertaining to a real estate transaction? A, it is acceptable. However, getting a loan for the property may be challenging. B, it is acceptable. C, a street address is not considered a legal description of the property. Last but not least, D, it is acceptable, but title insurance companies may choose not to insure the property. And the answer is C, a street address is not considered a legal description of the property. Let's look at the simple explanation here. A street address is not considered a legal description of the property. Now let's talk about this for a second. Legal description. A street address, 1341 Main Street, not a legal, not a legal description. The question here is referring to a legal document, which means we want a legal description of the property. You got it? Now, a legal description means we want to pinpoint exactly where this property is at, which means we have to use township, we have to use range, we have to use section. All these determine where exactly we can pinpoint where this property is located. It's on a map and it's pinpointed, it's squared off. This property is located from here to here to here. The address doesn't do it enough justice. We want to pinpoint this property, therefore we have to use township, range, section, you name it. And it's very, 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 can be very, very complicated, but it's necessary when we're describing property on a legal document. Got it? Good, let's move on. Next one, which of the following is not an example of functional obsolescence? Great question. Keyword here is functional. Which of the following is not an example of functional obsolescence? A, a bathroom that is open on both sides. B, a broken stove. C, a two-story house with one bathroom. D, a bridge with one lane. Functional obsolescence. The answer is B, a broken stove. When it comes to functional obsolescence, it's in working condition. It works fine. It just isn't designed properly. They're asking here which one is not functional. When the bottom line is which one of these is not working at all. And in this case, it is a broken stove. Let's look at the explanation here. 
functional obsolescence is a loss in value to an improvement resulting from functional problems caused by age or poor design. For example, let's look at letter A, a bathroom that is open on both sides. Works fine, poor design. A two-story house with one bathroom. Works fine, poor design. D, a bridge with one lane. Works fine, poor design. So which one of these is not an example of functional obsolescence? Which one of these is a piece of junk that just doesn't work? That would be B, a broken stove. Functional obsolescence. It functions, it just could have been designed better. Next one, if an appraiser is appraising a restaurant, what is the very best method to use? Fabulous question. Now we're talking about a restaurant, a business that's receiving income. They wanna make profit, keep that in mind. An appraiser is going into a piece of property, a business, to review its income. How do we put a value on that? Here we go. If an appraiser is appraising a restaurant, what is the very best method to use? A, highest and best use approach. B, none of these. C, depreciation approach. And D, income approach. Now think about that for a second after what I just explained to you. Receiving income, receiving profit, what could possibly be the answer here? D, income approach. Let's review the simple explanation down below. When appraising the value of a commercial property, the value is arrived by using the income capitalization approach. Anytime a restaurant, a commercial uh, business is receiving income, the appraiser will more likely than not use the income approach. Use the income approach because they have to analyze all the profit, all the expenses, put it all together. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called the income approach. Let's move on. All right, next one. Once a real estate agent receives deposit funds from a buyer, how many days does the agent have to deposit these funds into a trust or escrow account? Great question. Fair question. However, this question has no explanation. You just have to know the answer by memorization. So the answer to this is three business days. Nice and simple. Remember that three business days. Do me a big favor. Don't confuse this with three calendar days. Now, why do you think it's not three calendar days? Why isn't it? Why is it not three calendar days? Well, because there could be a holiday on Monday, there could be a holiday on Monday, Tuesday, it could be Thanksgiving on a Thursday and we're closed, it just makes a mess. So we take it towards three business days. Gives everybody a fair shot to get those funds into the escrow or trust account. Hope that helps you out. Let's move on to the next one. It has to be three business days, not calendar days. Next one, here's another one that you just flat out have to know it. No explanation, just have to know it. The Truth in Lending Act is also known as you gotta keep these together. The Truth in Lending Act is also known as Regulation A, Regulation X, Regulation Y, Regulation Z. The answer is Regulation Z. Let's look at the small and simple explanation. Regulation Z is the Federal Reserve Board regulation that implemented the Truth in Lending Act of 1968. Now how the hell are we gonna remember this with this explanation? It's gonna be very, very difficult. So bottom line is this. I want you to put Truth and Lending Act with Z as Zorro. Truth and Lending Act, Zorro. Simple as that. Z, it's a very fun letter, Z. You'll never forget it now, will you? Z, Z, Zorro. Truth and Lending Act. Next one, I actually really, really like this question. Nice and simple, here we go. Dual agency is legal when, A, everyone is made aware after the purchase agreement is signed and escrow opens, B, the buyer and seller consent to it and give written permission. C, the broker of record says it's okay. D, everyone is made aware at close of escrow. Bottom line is this, dual agency. Long as the principal, your principal, and the other party knows, which in this case is called the third party, it's okay, you can do it, but you have to get their permission before entering a contract. You can't, you can't surprise them with it once the contract is complete or at the end of the deal, you have to tell everybody the rules of the game on the up and up, at the very beginning of the game, at the very beginning of escrow, before we open escrow. Answer, B, the buyer and seller consent to it and give written permission. Always done prior to opening an escrow. Let's move on. Next question, the provisions of the Federal Fair Housing Law, which is also known as Title VIII, of the Civil Rights Act of 1968 allow for plaintiffs of discrimination to file A, 
all of the following. B, civil action in state or local courts. C, civil action in federal court. D, a complaint with HUD, which is the Department of Housing of Urban Development. Let's try this again. This is a very important question. The provisions of the Federal Fair Housing Law allow for plaintiffs of discrimination to file which of the following? The answer is A, all of these. Now, why wouldn't it? Anybody who's discriminated against should be able to file civil action anywhere. I mean, discrimination is horrible. Let's go to the, straight to the explanation. The Federal Fair Housing Law permits a person who has been discriminated against to bring such action to state or local courts as well as federal courts. They can also file a complaint with HUD. Remember, anytime anybody discriminated, we want to make certain that they have uh, a, a voice that's heard everywhere. Civilly, federally, state, local courts, everywhere. Answer here is all of these. Let's move on. Here's the statement, and we want to see which of these answers refer to the statement. The statement is a sale for less than is owed on a loan where the lender agrees to accept sale proceeds to extinguish a debt. A, short sale, B, probate sale, C, installment sale, D, trustee sale. One more time, here's the statement. A sale for less than is owed on a loan where the lender agrees to accept sale proceeds to extinguish a debt. The answer is short sale. Let's read the explanation on a short sale. Is when a homeowner in trouble offers to sell a property for less than the amount owed on a mortgage. This is a very complicated uh, topic, but it's a very clear and concise answer and question here. Simple, a short sale. Let me give you an example. The loan amount is a million dollars. The homeowner owes a million dollars. The house is only worth half a million dollars. So if the homeowner sells the property for half a million bucks, he still owes another half a million dollars to the bank. He owes them a total of a million dollars. You with me? The bank says, go ahead and sell it for what it's worth, half a million bucks. And we know you owe us another half a million bucks, but we're gonna forgive that. We're gonna give that, we're gonna forgive that second half a million dollars. That's called a short sale. That's exactly what this is explaining here. A sale for less than is owed on a loan. You owe a million bucks, you're only able to sell this property for half a million bucks. The bank didn't get all the deserved short sale. They agreed to it though. Let's move on. Next great question, here we go. What type of a state is of indefinite duration? Keyword here is indefinite. Don't be fooled. The state exam may give you some terms that will fool you, so be aware of these terms. In this particular sentence, what type of a state is of indefinite duration? Keyword here is indefinite, which means forever, a long time. A, a state in years. B, lean. C, a state of inheritance. D, a state less than freehold. The answer is C, a state of inheritance. And a state of inheritance is a fee simple estate and is of indefinite duration. A fee simple estate can last forever and ever and ever. It's typically how most homes are owned. Freehold estate. A freehold estate, you hold it freely. Also known as indefinite duration, a state of inheritance. Let's move on to the next one. Next question. Which of the following is an example of economic obsolescence? Keyword here is economic. It has to deal with the economy in the neighborhood. Which of the following is an example of economic obsolescence? A, demand has changed to larger floor plans. B, poor layout and design of the rooms in the house. C, property has fallen into disrepair. D, zoning in the area has changed. Great question. Keyword here in the, in the question is economic. Which of the following four have to deal with the economy of that neighborhood? Demand of larger floor plans? Obviously not. That has to do with structure. B, poor layout, has to deal with structure. C, property has fallen into disrepair, has to deal with structure. And D, zoning in the area has changed. That has a substantial amount to do with economic obsolescence, the economy of that neighborhood. If you change zoning from residential to commercial, it'll change, it'll, it'll bring more business to the neighborhood. That definitely will have an impact on the thrive of a neighborhood. So in this case, which of the following is an example of economic obsolescence? Zoning would, nice and simple. The others would be functional obsolescence. Let's move on. What year was the transfer disclosure statement amended to include the disclosure of the presence of carbon monoxide detector 
in the property? Great question. This one, again, is going to be one that you'll have to memorize. It's a, it's a year. And you have to memorize the year. I actually remember this happening in my career. We always had a disclosure when it came to smoke detectors. And then in this particular year, they wanted to include carbon monoxide detectors on properties when they were sold. Now, what year did this happen? The answer is 2011, 2012, 2010, or 2015. Take a guess. The answer is 2010. Disclosure requirements are always being evaluated and updated. In 2010, changes were made to include the disclosure of the presence of carbon monoxide detectors in the property. Carbon monoxide detectors, 2010. 2010, 2010. Let's go back to Truth of Lending Act. Remember that one? What regulation was that? Z for Zorro. Huh? Remember that one? Good. Let's move on. All right, next question is a statement. Here we go refers to the practice of representing either the buyer or the seller, but never both in the same transaction. In this case, you have one principle. You're representing one, either the buyer or the seller. A, is that considered accidental dual agency? Is it B, minor agency? Is it C, single agency? Is it D, dual agency? Now think about that, but I don't want you to think about it too long. It's rather simple. You represent one. Which one of these answers refer to one individual? The answer is single agency. Of course it is. A single agency is the representation of only one party or one principal to a transaction. For example, a seller's agent or a buyer's agent. You take your pick. You want to represent a seller? Be my guest. You want to represent a buyer? Be my guest. But when you represent just one of them, it's considered single agency. Wait a minute. Bonus question. When you represent both on the same transaction, is considered what? Yeah, look at that one down there, the letter D, it would be considered dual agency. In this particular question, single agency. Know the difference. Single agency, represent one party. Dual agency, you represent both. Next question. Type of financing wherein the seller is financing the buyer. Good question. You might see this in your career. Type of financing wherein the seller is financing the buyer. A, creative financing, B, hybrid financing, C, carry back financing, D, interim financing. Think about that for a second. Now, why would a seller finance a buyer? Why doesn't the buyer just go to the bank and get a, get a bank loan? Sometimes the buyer can't. They have horrible credit, not enough income. Whatever case it may be, they just don't qualify for a bank loan. But the seller's understanding and the seller says, don't worry about it. My criteria is a lot more flexible. I'll be your lender. I'll finance the house for you. You make payments to me. What should we call this? Let's take a look here. The answer is C, carry back financing. Explanation right there. This happens when conventional financing is not available to the buyer in the amount required or it is too costly or for whatever reason. They utilize the seller, and the seller agrees, yeah, I'll, I'll finance the house for you. Let's move on. Next question. What is the primary purpose of city and county building codes? Fair. What is the primary purpose of city and county building codes? Key here is building codes. A, setting minimum setback standards from a street to protect the landowner. B, setting minimum standards for public health, safety, and general welfare. C, setting minimum wage pay for the general workforce. D, setting occupancy restrictions for a restaurant. Again, let's go back to the question. What is the primary purpose of city and county building codes? Keyword here is building codes, building codes, building codes. The answer is B, setting minimum standards for public health, safety, and general welfare. Building codes are created to set the minimum standards for construction purposes. They are enforced by local government departments as they exercise their police power. All part of making the buildings as safe as possible. Hope this helps you out. Hey, listen, we just gave you a nice gift. We gave you a handful of questions that you'll probably see on the state exam. And we're going to go ahead and uh, provide those to you with our state exam prep package. If you go to our website, you can get more questions like this. In fact, over a thousand of them. You can check the link down below. Click on it now. Get more like this. If you practice way at all these questions, I guarantee it, it will help you when it comes to that state exam. We wish you all the best. Good luck, and we'll see you next week.